go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Crushing the darkness of the world with the sacred. Returning to the sacred. We're going to be having a conversation today with David L. Gray about a return to the sacred. He's gathered 27 unique individuals from all over the Catholic world to talk about how can we return to a sense of the sacred in all aspects of life, actually? We'll have that conversation at 30 past the hour. Anna Reynolds is on our program from Inspire Virtue. She's got an article over at Crisis Magazine asking the question, why are Americans having fewer children than they want? It really made me think, really, do Americans really want more children? I mean, isn't the have a girl, have a boy, be all done with it kind of routine been the standard for many years now? So number one, do they want more kids? And number two, if they do, then why aren't they having them? Anna Reynolds will join us at 15 past the hour to have that conversation. Everything that we talk about today in the news and the conversations and all of it is going to be posted in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. That's thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. Do me a favor, though. Coming up next week is our fall on-air fundraiser where we come to you and ask you for your financial contribution to keep us on the air, to keep us streaming live across not only 20 radio stations, but around the world on iCatholic Radio, on our live streams, on social media, and everywhere else. Please do pray for a successful fun drive next week. But let's pray. Let's dive in. We have a lot to get to today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come. Before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your Saint of the Day. Saint Isaac Jogues, pray for us. Isaac Jogues was born in 1607 in Orléans, France. He entered the Jesuits at the age of 17 and taught literature before his ordination in 1636. He was soon sent as a missionary to the New World, a calling he had eagerly contemplated. After landing in Quebec, Father Jogues and others preached the gospel to the Hurons and others around the Great Lakes, where St. Jean de Brebeuf was already working, and the black robes, or black coats as they were known, reached as far west as Sault Ste. Marie. On a journey in 1642, Father Jogues and others were captured by Mohawks, members of the Iroquois Confederacy, and brutally tortured for over a year. Several missionaries met their martyrdom, and Father Jogues only escaped with the help of some Dutch Calvinists who succeeded in bringing him to New Amsterdam, where the first Catholic priest to visit Manhattan Island was hailed with great respect even by the Protestant colonists. Among his gruesome injuries, Father Jogues had several fingers cut off or even chewed down to the bone with the fingernails torn out. When the priest returned to Europe, he was hailed as a living martyr, and the Pope granted Father Jogues renewed permission to offer the Holy Mass despite his mutilated hands. The brave priest chose to return to the New World, and he was chosen as part of a French embassy to the Iroquois in 1646. He was blamed by one clan for a disease outbreak, and soon taken prisoner once more. On October 18th, Father Jogues was killed by a tomahawk blow to the head. He and his fellow North American martyrs were canonized in 1930 by Pope Pius XI, with their feast assigned to September 26th in Canada and on the traditional calendar for the United States. St. Isaac Jogues and the North American Martyrs Pray for us. And now your headline news. LifeSite News reports Zelensky asked controversial occult artist Marina Abramovich to be an ambassador for Ukraine. 
Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has asked controversial performance artist Marina Abramovich to represent Ukraine as an ambassador. Abramovich has devoted her career to being an artist provocateur, frequently incorporating nudity, violence, and satanic symbols into her very public live art displays. Over the years, Abramovich has famously written billboard-sized messages in pig's blood, etched pentagrams into her stomach with razor blades, put devilish horns on her head, and even hosted dinners meant to realistically imitate cannibalism. And that's just the points that we could share with you because the rest is X-rated and disgusting. Anyway, The Hill reports Defiant Menendez refuses to resign after indictment. The U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York unveiled charges last week against Senator Bob Menendez from New Jersey and his wife Nadine, accusing them of accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars in bribes in exchange for using the senator's power and influence to enrich a trio of New Jersey businessmen. Federal agents seized more than $480,000 in cash stuffed in envelopes and hidden in clothing and closets as well as two one-kilogram gold bars and nine one-ounce gold bars when they raided his home in June of 2022. Menendez has since faced calls to resign from Democrats, including New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy, multiple members of Congress from New Jersey, and Democrat leadership in Trenton. Ground News reports tentative deal reached to end Hollywood writers' strike. No deal yet for actors. Screenwriters in the U.S. have reached a tentative deal with the studio bosses, potentially ending a nearly five-month-long strike that has halted most film and TV production in Hollywood. Actors have also been on strike since mid-July, seeking similar contract updates to those requested by the writers. Both the Writers Guild and Actors Union need to agree on three-year contracts with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television producers before returning to work. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Luke chapter 8, verses 19 through 21. The mother of Jesus and his brothers came to him, but were unable to join him because of the crowd. He was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they wish to see you. He said to them in reply, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and act on it. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that last sign is a telltale, isn't it? My brother, my mother, and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and act on it. College you is. It's kind of like, uh, hmm. Is Mary special because of her biology? No. Mary is special because of her fiat. Because when God asked her so much to bear the Messiah, to bear to see the Messiah die on a cross... She said, fiat, let it be done unto me according to thy will. That is what makes Mary special. It is because she gives herself perfectly to the will of God. And this line is very telling. And yet so many of you, your friends, your family would read this in another way. They would see this as almost a negative when really it's a positive. It's definitely holding up our lady in a light that you had not considered before. The Venerable B, St. B would say, But those who are said to be our Lord's brethren, according to the flesh, you must not imagine to be the children of the Blessed Mary, the mother of God, as Helvidius thinks, nor the children of Joseph by another wife, as some say, but rather believe to be their kinsfolk. This is a, a point that has come up many times in the past. It doesn't seem to come up all that often much anymore, but the brothers, uh, the brothers of Jesus... The, there is no distinction in that original language between brother and cousin. Kinsfolk is what's meant. Kinsfolk. It's not specific to just being the brother. Although some translations have tried to make this distinction by inserting that distinction in an English language or what have you. But there wasn't one in the original language. The Ignatius Catholic Study Bible says in verse uh, from verse uh, 21 of chapter 8, on my brethren, not Mary's children, but probably the cousins of Jesus. See Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 500. On the hear the word of God and do it, the, the uh, Ignatius Catholic Study Bible says Jesus' spiritual family shares his life and follows his way. Mary's divine motherhood was established on this same basis. She embraces God's will throughout her life. 
The applicant would say, but some take this to mean that certain men hating Christ's teaching and mocking at him for his doctrine said, thy mother and thy brethren stand without wishing to see thee as if thereby to, to show his meanness of birth. In other words, how common he is. Look at this guy. Who is this guy preaching all this stuff? Look how common he is. His mom is standing outside. It's like, uh, it's like the high school cafeteria, right? It's all like good grief. At some point, we all have to grow up. But nonetheless, the applicant goes on to say, And he, therefore, knowing their hearts, gave them this answer, that meanness of birth harms not. But if a man, though of low birth, hear the word of God, he reckons him as his kinsman. Because, however, hearing only saves no one, but rather condemns, he adds, and doeth it. For it becomes us both to hear and to do. Do you get that? It becomes us to both hear and to do. It's not good enough that you simply hear the word of God. Yes. Amen, Lord. Amen. You have to do it. Did you catch that? You have to do it. You are judged on how you have taken that faith that you proclaim and lived it. What have you done with this gift that you have been given, this talent? Did you bury it in a field or did you bring a return on the investment? Because God is coming on the day of reckoning to figure out what you have done with his investment. You better act now. Your time is running out. Tick, tick, tick. May we be like Our Lady and say fiat. May we be like his brethren, his disciples, who have left father and mother and spouse and land and gave it all over to God and followed him. Are we like that? Or do we hold on tight to this world because it's just everything we really, really want? We better make a choice. We better do it fast. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. As part of our efforts to teach the beauty of our faith, we're broadcasting a special educational lesson every Wednesday called Lessons in Latin. I'm Canon Bourgeois, a priest of the Institute of Christ the King, Sovereign Priest. These mini teachings break down the history of the various parts of the Holy Mass. You can hear Lessons in Latin on Wednesdays at approximately 5.15 a.m., 3.45 p.m., and 9.40 p.m. Eastern Time. That's Lessons in Latin Wednesdays at 5.15 a.m., 3.45 p.m., and 9.40 p.m. on the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Be to Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Tick, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. At 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation with David L. Gray about how to crush the darkness in the world by returning to a sense of the sacred. From all walks of life, he has gathered a team of people to have conversations around a return to the sacred. And we'll have that conversation with David L. Gray at 30 past the hour. Do join us. Do join us if you can. But there are lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. And I was utterly fascinated yesterday when I came across this article over Crisis Magazine. Why are Americans having fewer children than they want? Anna Reynolds joins us. She has a website, inspirevirtue.com. We're going to be posting links to both of these things in the show notes today over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Anna, good morning to you. Thank you for your time today. Good morning. Good to be here. Anna, I was really fascinated by this. But the first thing that struck me about your article over crisis, why are Americans having fewer children than they want, was do Americans really want more children? I mean, hasn't the have a girl, have a boy, be all done with it? Uh, been the sort of the routine now for a few decades? You would think, but when you talk to people, you get a more nuanced story. And it's interesting the reactions you get if you go out in public with young kids. People will look at you very nostalgically and they'll say, I miss it, but I don't. I, I miss it, but I don't. That's the comment I've gotten a lot. And so there is something just irreplaceable about the energy that young kids bring. And What's gotten me really interested in this topic is we talk a lot about the birth rate declining. And what many people don't realize is as the birth rate declines, you don't just have fewer children. You have a different type of culture. And it is a culture that's concerned with an aging population. So fewer risk-taking, 
less uh, community building of a certain type, less interconnectedness, more loneliness, more isolation. And so I think on some level, people want kids. Uh, They just don't necessarily want to have them. Mm. We've kind of designed our life, and this is, I think, the point of your article. We have designed our lives, and maybe somewhat intentionally, maybe we've just all been so accustomed to the culture around us to live at a certain way that we have designed our lives so that it's uh, having more children becomes more difficult. I have six kids. I have three grandkids, praise be to God. And uh, we've, we've, we've got the stairs and that's not even like, I'm probably one of the smaller, you know, families at our parish. So we've gotten the stairs at the grocery store. We've, we've gotten the, the, uh, the whole, is this a homeschool conference with all the white passenger vans in the parking lot routine? And, uh, and yet we've also been made to feel bad about that. Even from the Pope Francis himself has made disparaging remarks. Have we, have we embraced the world in such a way that we have naively just limited our children? Yeah, in some ways. And I think um, people tend to get very despairing about how difficult it is to have children, how expensive it is to have children, how challenging it is. And But, I mean, you have six children. Many people have six children. Many people have more than that, as you said. And finding those people and seeing how they are actually making it happen instead of uh, sort of sitting around wringing our hands spreading about how difficult it is to have children. And you see this even in Catholic circles. People will think that going to private school is essential. And so they will say, well, we cannot have any more children. Like, well, is going to private school essential? Mm -hmm. If you meet families um, who have a lot of kids and see how they actually make it happen and to find the joyful large families. There are are many families who, um, large and small, who struggle to live joyfully. But if you find large families who are joyful and you see what they're doing, that can be practical inspiration instead of spreading about what in our culture makes it difficult to have children. I think a lot of kids that come from small families like myself, uh, I only had one sibling growing up, you realize you wish you had, like, I wish I had a brother. I wish I had someone I could have, mm-hmm. you know, uh, hung out with, played with, been mentored by uh, as a kid. I think there's a sense of loss in that. Do you see that in families Do you, as they get older, maybe, and, they, and they've and uh, they gone through their childbearing years, these parents look back and, and maybe there's a sense of regret there? Definitely. I think what's even sadder than that is people know so few families. I'm shocked visiting family on the East Coast, how few people even know families who have more than three kids. So the concept of larger families is disappearing and um, people don't, they no longer recognize their own loneliness. So you having your six kids, having grandkids, being in a community with a lot of families, you can see it would have been nice to have more siblings to do stuff with. And if you notice, a lot of people will talk about growing up, if you grew up in a small family, you may have had a friend with a large family, like that was the place you wanted to be. There is always something happening, which of course, as the parent can be a little exhausting because there's always something happening. (laughs) But uh, that is like, that's what people want to be around and be part of. And that our vocation is always lived out in connection to other people. And um, what I... Yeah, what I've seen is people who prevent themselves from having more children and they don't even realize that what they are feeling mm. is loneliness. Why do you think we have also accepted this uh, two-income rule? I mean, it seems like young couples getting together still have this idea that there needs to be two incomes in the home. And I think they're, they're setting themselves up for a trap. If they can't live within their means on one income, then how are they ever truly going to be open to life? They're going to be self-regulating and that's not good. Yeah, I think uh, this is something I write about a lot from a lot of different angles because there's so many facets to this, which is we educate men and women to have careers. So you're never given the option to be a stay-at-home mom. And that doesn't necessarily mean that like you um, are just at home doing domestic things. There are many large families, like the, the financial needs of a large family are many. Um, So if the mom has entrepreneurial know-how and she can be part of a family business or she can have um, other ways of contributing to the family, like that can be huge. And I think we have this false dichotomy of either 
you have a corporate job that is nine to five, or you are a stay at home mom and you quote unquote do nothing. <laughs> and there are so many other paths in between. The bigger issue, as you were saying, is we are set up with this expectation that you have two incomes and we are seduced by all these silly things like vacations and just the added extra technological subscriptions. And I mean, if you have a lot of kids, it's probably going to be too expensive to eat out a lot, but there's a lot of other things you can do. Um, so you just have to set expectations and live accordingly, which again, like going back to finding real families with a lot of kids who are doing it well and seeing what are they doing. And um, then you can actually enjoy the path they're taking. <laughs> you just reminded me once years and years ago, my oldest son who's married with kids own kids. Now he wanted to go to a restaurant for like his birthday. We were going to a Hobbit inspired restaurant and they charged me like over a hundred dollars, 20% added gratuity. They expected, I was just like, it's going to take me a month of Sundays just to pay this off. It was so expensive. But uh, <laughs> you, just remind, you just triggered that in my mind. But let's talk about something else that you mentioned in your article that I found also very almost humorous because we had gone through it. Like you get, you get expanding past a certain number of kids, like five kids, six kids. All of a sudden, the vehicles become much more limited in options. Like getting enough, getting a, a big enough vehicle that can uh, bring your family to wherever they got to go and with all of their stuff is a lot harder and often a lot more expensive. We had to go down that road going from minivans to SUVs up to the 15 passenger uh, cargo van, uh, passenger van uh, that we've had now since uh, 2000, I think it was 17. And, uh, and it is, it does add a big burden. It's harder for big families to financially ha just have the, the, the basic stuff. Definitely. Um, again, I would say finding practical tips. The other thing I find fascinating is there are certainly Christian, other religions, but also secular people having a lot of kids. And if you look around online um, and more importantly, in person, you can find the tips and tricks. Like, how do people make this work? How do they um, afford a car of that size? How do they set up the car seats to get everybody in there? Um and especially, I would say, like getting some advice from secular people can sometimes be especially helpful because it is not in any way an inevitability to have a lot of kids. I think if you get into certain Catholic circles, there is this kind of bitterness that can fester because like, oh, we're Catholic, we have to have all these kids, which is a very odd attitude when you consider how many people you know who can't have kids or can't have as many kids as they want to. Um, mm -hmm. in Catholic circles or otherwise. So, um, but going to the secular advice, uh, I recently joined an online forum. This is, this is where I do my research, I must say. <laughs> and there's a lot of secular families with more than six kids who have the 15 passenger van and talk about how they do it. So I think, um, yeah, it's going to be a lot harder to travel by like airplane, um, but you're giving your child a day-to-day -day experience that is so rich in people. Like there is a purpose to this. And if you keep the big picture in mind and you get some of the practical know-how from other people in your same stage of life, you're not going to feel so isolated, so alienated, and so frustrated by how difficult it is. Would you say the biggest roadblock to families that are in the category of they really wish they could have more, but but uh, their circumstances aren't allowing it? Would you say that their, their biggest roadblock is really just the commitment to reordering their life such that they can uh, be open to being having more kids? I mean, in other words, live in a, in a cheaper home or or uh, be more frugal, live within your means, pay off your debts, those kinds of things. Do you think that's the biggest roadblock? In a lot of ways, I think we do live in an age of increasingly uh, just disconnection from the particulars. It's very, it, it becomes more difficult to align each of your choices with what you actually want because there's so many distractions and there's so many options. It's always like choose your own adventure. You can have exactly your individual perfect commercial whatever. And so you can end up making a lot of choices your career, your uh, lifestyle, and not realize that you can actually afford what it is that you really want. So, um, and that's where living in a faith community can be such a powerful way of aligning your priorities so that you are 
putting first things first. First things first. I love that. Oh, we're, we're almost out of time here with Anna Reynolds. She has this website, uh, Inspire Virtue. We're going to be putting a link to this uh, article that we saw in Crisis Magazine, as well as to her blog, inspirevirtue.com. And I'm grateful for your time today. I feel like this is a, an interesting conversation because it seems to me, and I'm going to give this the last point here, it seems to me that families, there there might be a sense of turning the hearts of families away from materialism, away from the, uh, what this world is trying to offer it. And there there's a sense of like, ah, oh, there's something more. I should have this something more. Would you say that's fair? Definitely. And like I said, I think people have become so lonely and so isolated. We no longer realize how lonely we are. And a large family can be this powerful symbol of putting people first. And that is how ultimately we all want to live. We want to be in heaven in communion with God and other people. Amen. Well said. Anna Reynolds, God bless you. God love you. I appreciate your time today. I'd love to have you back soon. Uh, But check out her website, inspirevirtue.com inspirevirtue.com God bless you Anna have a great day we'll put a link to that I guess I said in the show notes and after the break we're going to have more breaking news and stories and then uh, David O'Gray is on talk about return to the sacred crushing the darkness of this world with a return to the sacred I don't know how he did it but he got a cabal of 27 uh, scallywags from around the Catholic Catholic world to talk about a return to the sacred. All of that and more is headed your way after this break. But do me a favor, share us with a friend. We'd be incredibly grateful to you. We'll be right back. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. CNA reports Swiss bishop calls for women's ordination and into celibacy ahead of the synod. Quote, it's time to abolish mandatory celibacy, close quote. Bishop Felix Gamur of Basel told a Swiss newspaper on September the 24th, just days ahead of his participation at the Synod on Synodality in Rome next week. Gamur didn't stop at questioning celibacy, though. He went and waded into the contentious issue of ordination of women. Quote, the subordination of women in the Catholic Church is incomprehensible to me. Changes are needed there, close quote, he declared, going on to say, quote, I'm in favor of the ordination of women. It will also be a topic of the Synod that will soon take place in Rome, close quote, Gamur stated. College US, I wonder if Bishop Bar- Barron knows that they're trying to change all this. Anyway, uh, the article goes on to say the Swiss Bishops Conference under Gamur's leadership since January of 2019 has faced criticism for its handling of over 1,000 cases of sexual abuse that have been reported. Hey, the Daily Signal is reporting federal government programs allow more than 200,000 illegal aliens to fly right over the border. Over the past year, more than 200,000 people from four countries used a direct flight parole program to enter the United States illegally, said Todd Benzman, senior national security fellow at the Washington-based think tank devoted to researching immigration issues. Those 221,456 illegal aliens from Haiti, Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. The Biden administration introduced the CBP-1 mobile app, to illegal aliens as a way to schedule an appointment at a port of entry and be paroled into the interior of the United States. So far, U.S. Customs and Border Protection has reported encountering more than 460,000 illegal aliens from Venezuela alone on America's border since the Biden presidency began in 2021. Speaking of of immigration problems, a Catholic vote reports Biden admin threatens to deport homeschoolers. A homeschooling family who has lived in the United States legally for the past 15 years is now being threatened with deportation. The Romiki family are evangelical Christians who fled Germany to East Tennessee back in 2008 after German authorities fined them for homeschooling as it's illegal there. In 2013, the Obama-Biden administration's Department of Justice denied Romiki's claim for asylum, claiming, quote, the goal in Germany is for an open, pluralistic society, close quote. The administration appeared to side with Germany's homeschooling ban, claiming that the family was not being persecuted in their home country. And those, those are your headline news. Perhaps the Romiki should have just gone south, gone over the border from the south. Nobody questions that, bro. Anyway... 
Uh, there is a great group of people on our program every day, and they're from all over the world. And praise be to God for it. Our iCatholic Radio listeners, we love having you on the team. Thank you for doing it. You can listen to Catholic Radio 24-7, clear as crystal. Just down it, download it in your iOS or Android app store today, iCatholic Radio. Please do check it out and join the team. We'd love to have you. David L. Gray joins us. He's just put out a whole course here, Return to the Sacred, a discussion course on the dispelling of darkness in the world. And some folks in the chat box are calling it the Avengers, the mighty Avengers, the Catholic Avengers. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty impressive group of folks. Anyway, uh, David L. Gray, good morning to you. Thank you for your time today. Good morning, Joe McClain. Thanks for having me on to talk about this. Uh, is it Scallywags? Is it Avengers? I'm just curious in who you've got on the team today, but uh, 27 <laughs> Catholics from all walks in all over the world, it seems, uh, coming together to talk about a return to the sacred. What do you mean by a return to the sacred? Yeah, so we're basically asking three questions. So we were able to assemble this amazing group, including yourself who came on, did an amazing lesson. And so I wanted to ask, as many people as I could, from priests to deacons to religious to evangelists to theologians, just these three basic questions. The first one was, what happened to the sense of the sacred? And the second was, well, if we lost the sense of the sacred, well, what have we lost along the way? Some things may have dropped off if we lost the sense of the sacred or what is true, what is holy, these gifts from God. Well, what have we lost if we lost that sense? And the last one was, how do we recover it? So it is amazing, even though these 27 people all from like diverse areas, like these aren't just like a bunch of like rad trads or anything like that. We have um, people in here like um, Michael Hishborn, um, yourself, Doug Berry, um, uh, Brian Holdsworth, and no one has really called him like a radical traditionalist, Dr. Janice Smith, David Torkington. I mean, just uh, just Catholics from across the board who are well-educated, thoughtful, have thought about these things for a long time. Many of them, like yourself and Brian Holdsworth, who have spoken about these things for, for many years, um, came together to say, hey, let's let's deal with this because this is the most important question of our day. What happened to the sense of the sacred? Because we look around, Joe, and we see things are just off. You know, we're calling things are human rights that doesn't seem to be true. We're calling things such as transgender rights, homosexual rights, abortion rights. These things that seem that society have told us are sacred and holy, these things that, that we can't let go of, they've told us these things over decades that these are things that are true. These are things that we have to hold on to. But the more the more time goes on, the more we're discovering that all these things are antithetical to what it means to be Catholic. All these things are antithetical to what it means to be holy. So, and a lot of people have told me ever since I've become Catholic that, oh, we just have to return to tradition. We just need to return to tradition and that will fix everything. And I started asking the question, well, what traditions? Like every tradition isn't sacred. Every tradition isn't holy. So there has to be something under that, something more fundamental, more basic that we have to find that will help us return to um, those things that will really redirect our course and, and, and mm. put us on a, a more sure path for that narrow way. You know, as you were saying that, uh, it's all about basic. I was just thinking about uh, the upcoming uh, Feast of Our Lady of Victory, October the 7th, uh, the Battle of Lepanto. Don Juan of Austria being the Admiral of the Holy League that, uh, that brought about victory on that day through Our Lady, praise be to God. But uh, he was the half-brother of, of the King of Spain. Well, you know, his dad, okay, who had him out of wedlock, he didn't deny the Ten Commandments. He didn't go about society proclaiming that uh, we could choose our genders as we like or that you can shoplift in the local store so long as it doesn't equal 900 bucks or or you know what I mean? Like at no time did did Don Juan's dad ever publicly embrace some false ideology or false thinking of of reason or truth. He he conducted his sinful nature in the dark and the shadows. But at the same time, it didn't publicly transform society through the embracing of the world of flesh and the devil. And yet I think that's one of the big things that seems to have changed in our time is that our leaders are not only doing these things in the shadows, but they're doing them in the public too, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And, and I think that's a sign that, man, maybe we had a diminishing sense of the sacred for a while, 
um, we've had a diminishing sense of what is holy, what is true. But we could also look at like, like a more recent turning point. Remember when when President Bill Clinton, uh, we kind of like gave him a pass on things that we wouldn't give a president a pass on before. So it, it just seems to be we're just the further we get along, the more it seems to be that, man, not only have we lost the sense of the sacred, but just just outright sin and debauchery is like cool and acceptable. And that's become a virtue. Yeah, yeah, it sure has. Now, one of the things I love about your lineup that you started mentioning some of the names a minute ago was just the sheer diversity of this group that you have. You do have yeah. a very diverse group of, of Catholics from from all walks, really, from all sort of uh, perspectives, too. Um, you know, some of them are going to be very focused on sort of like their world, like pro-life or or uh, mm-hmm. Catholic outreach or or mm-hmm. politics like I like to cover a lot or just there's so many different perspectives out of this entire list. And you can't choose me because you have no sucking up on the show today, David O'Grey. <laughs> so I can't be in the, included in this list. But I go out of all this list. Who was the most surprising to you that you really uh, felt like you took away quite a bit from? Well, everyone that I spoke to, except for one, was someone who I never had an interaction with. And that, that was Brian Holsworth. So he's someone who I maybe seen some videos of. He's a social media influencer. He's really popular on YouTube. I had you know, seen his videos over the years. I had never had a conversation with him. So that was surprising in a sense. I didn't know that where, where that was going to go. But it kind of went to a place that I always uh, that I should have been familiar with with his content. It went into the culture. He wanted to make an argument. Well, it's, it's been a change. We lost a sense of culture. So that was surprising in a sense. But the one that um, so another one who I had spoken to via email, but we never had a conversation was David Torrington. Mm-hmm. And he is a Catholic mystical, spiritual prayer theologian, um, a lay theologian. And he's been writing and thinking about contemplative prayer for such a long time. And so I took away from our conversation just the um, yeah, how how prayer or the loss of contemplative prayer, how that's affected our loss of the sense of the sacred. So I'm thinking every conversation, every all the 27 conversations, I've been able to take it away, take away something that's impacted how I thought about this subject. And I think when people take this course and, you know, of course it's free, everyone can go there. You don't even have to register. Um, of course, you don't have, to, it's, it's not in a sequential order. You can just kind of pick and choose over the next, however long you want to listen to it. I think you're going to just leave with, from each lesson, even answering some of the questions that's presented because it's built for individuals and groups in church, small groups, whatever. You're going to leave there with any- something that says, man, I never thought about that. Is there, is there, could you distill down these 27 conversations into some basic principles that basic, that all of them seem to touch upon? Yeah, that that was, that was crazy. (laughs) Joe. Cause these people, some of them disagree with each other about points, you know, non-dogmatic points. These aren't people who all are, are all um, have like, um, you know, like I said, they're going to probably disagree with each other about some things, but it was so, it was so amazing that there are some common themes that kept coming back again and again and again. One of them was a lot of people really thought that the sexual revolution was like one of those turning points in the 50s, 60s, and mm-hmm. 70s. One of those turning points that like changed everything. So a lot of people kept coming back to that point. And then a lot of the men who we spoke with, like yourself, like Deacon Harold, like um, Jordan Pacheco, I think he has a show on the stations that are across town, Ask Your Um So that's, that's real. I've listened to that. Um, Father Richard Howman, Doug Berry, of course. So a lot of the men, oh, even Abby, even Abby Johnson chimed in on this, that something's happened to manhood. Like we've lost a sense of what it means to be a man. We've lost a sense of masculinity. And that's mm. impacted a sense of the sacred because it impacted leadership in a home, leadership in a family, leadership in marriage, in a church. Boy, we're up against the break. We should come up. We should talk about that on the other side of the break because that's a good point. I just had a conversation on Sunday. I gave a, a talk to a group of, of teens at a parish and they split the room up to boys and girls. And I looked over at the boys and I said, the difference between a boy and a man it ain't his age. Uh, a boy wants comfort in this world. A boy wants to be uh, loved and uh, and told he's amazing and just feel always comfortable, good food, video games, all the rest. A man does what's necessary to uh, to pursue mm-hmm. virtue and to uh, his state in life, to provide, to protect. Mm-hmm. 
to guard, to keep, and to guide. And uh, and boy, is that ever lost. That is so lost in society. So I definitely want to chime back on that. But we're having a conversation with David L. Gray about a return to the sacred, a discussion course on the dispelling of darkness in the world. Let me ask you this with seconds on the clock before we go to break, David L. Gray. Do you think there is a political solution to fixing the world? Or is it the return to the sacred that really is the secret to transforming the society around us? Yeah, Liz, you on her lesson. I think she connected, said there's a connection between the both, because once you pursue the sacred, that's going to have an impact upon the public sphere. And we have to be active in that. So I, I would agree with her. Mm. Well, we're going to we're going to dive deeper into this right now. But you can get this entire 27 lecture series course from David O'Gray's website, St. Dominic dot com. We're going to put a link to the course in the show notes, of course. But that's St. Dominic dot com. S-A-I-N-T. And uh, all 27. You don't have to register. You just click play. That's it. Now, you can you can toss him a, a donation. That'd be helpful to him. I'm sure he'd love to see that. But nonetheless, it's free and you can check it out today. But I do want to go a little bit deeper into, boy, if only men would stand up to be men. Imagine what could happen in the world around us. That's coming up after the break, of course. David L. Gray being our guest. But we would be very grateful to you if you would share us with a friend. Well, you can do that right now. You can text your friends. You can send them an email. A smoke signal if you have to. Carry your pigeon. Whatever you got to do. But share us with a friend. Help us spread the word about what we're doing here at the Station of the Cross. We would be incredibly grateful to you. More of David L. Gray and a return to the sacred is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Coming up at the top of the hour, we're going to say goodbye to the radio audience. We're going to stay on the live video feed for the after show where we dive into your comments. You get to drive that conversation with whatever you want to talk about. That is on the agenda. We call it the after show. You can hang out with us at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. There's a live video player there. And there's icons to the different video feeds underneath it. So if you want to chat, you can do so. But we're having a conversation about a return to the sacred. And it's been dubbed the Catholic Avenger team that David O'Gray has uh, has assembled in KP Jack 06. Golly, you as I'm supposed to be the Thor of the Catholic Avengers and David gets to be the <laughs> Iron Man? Really? Why do I have to be a Greek god? Why can't I be the cool scientist with the iron suit? Why does David get that? Golly, you as Anyway, David, welcome back to the show. A return to the sacred. One thought I had over the break was, you know what? Even amongst like practicing Catholics, people like you, people like me, people who are trying, we're, we're trying, we're trying to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. We go to Mass every mm-hmm. Sunday, if maybe it's even a few times before Sundays. We go to confession regularly. We have a prayer life. We have devotion. We are trying. That's the category I'm talking about. But even in that category, right. I'm speaking of myself here. I'm, there's still so much of this world that I, I'm attached to. So much of a uh, wastedness on entertainments or pleasures or comfort or food or just affirmations. I want my ego to be stroked. I want people to tell me how good I am or et cetera, et cetera. But so even in that more fervent category, it seems like we really still are too attached to the world. Would you say that was one of the common themes that came up in all these conversations? You know what? It's, it wasn't, Joe. You know, that was interesting. Of course, when we had Father Gregory Matori, he's a Dominican, he's religious. Of course, he brought, he brought that perspective and he brought it very hard. I mean, if you listen mm-hmm. to his lesson, you just kind of walk away like, man, I got some work to do, right? Because he's, you know, he's a religious who's worked in mission fields. He's worked with the poor. And he made a mm-hmm. contrast between the things that they're worried about in Africa and some other countries. And he said, hey, you know, we're over here worrying about some really some first world issues about, you know, homosexuality <laughs> and stuff like that. They're over yeah. there worrying about food and shelter mm-hmm. and some basic things. And because of they, they have less, they can focus more on those spiritual things, right? They, they, they have less, distra- that fewer distractions. So, but yeah, I completely agree with you. And I, I left his lesson like thinking like, man, um, I got to throw a bunch of stuff away, you know, starting with my office <laughs> to scale down my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really, if I did an audit of, of what I spend my time on, <laughs> I, mean, I work hard and I, but I also sometimes play hard too. So, you know, it just reminds me that yeah. 
golly gee whiz, even in our category, there is much work to be done. And I think that's maybe a valuable lesson for us to remember for those that aren't in our category. We got to meet them where they're at, help them get them where they're going. But if it's hard for us, it's going to be hard for them too. Maybe we've forgotten that. The other thing I thought about is, you know, a return to the sacred. What does it mean? Like you you talked earlier about like uh, traditions, like just return to the traditions. I've grown more traditional in my faith as I've grown more zealous and uh, praise be to God for it. But I think you're right in the sense that if tradition without its context is becomes a pretext almost, right? So tradition can be taken out of context and tradition gets its life. The fan that uh, flame uh, to fan that flame of tradition is to put it in the sense of the sacred, uh, the good, the true and the beautiful mm-hmm. handed on from one generation to the next. And I have to tell you, I, I, w- I would love to say, oh, that is, you know, that's what's his name that does that. No, it's Maria von Trapp for crying out loud. That's who I think of. It's it's these women who are leading the way of living tradition in the family life. I rarely think of a man who leads the charge on living tradition in the family life, living sacred in the family life. It's generally a woman who does that. Would you agree to that or no? That's something to think about. I haven't really thought, put much thought into that, like like you have. Um, just my instant reaction, like I, I really don't know. I, I would like to know more about that. But but I think that common theme that they, that kept coming up, like you mentioned earlier, I did it, it did bring out that deficit. Like a lot of men, like you, do believe that. Even James Merrick, who is he he did a wonderful lesson on just sacred music. It's one of the most phenomenal things I think a lot of people will ever hear. But at the end of his lesson, he just opined about how where's the men at in sacred music? Um, in the Norvis Order rites, a lot of Norvis Order parishes, people would say, "Oh, where's the ultra boys?" But he's in the Institute of Christ the King parish. He's like, "Where's the men with these beautiful voices?" We just forsaken a lot of things. Um, that and, and by sacred, of course, we just mean what's holy, what's from God. Those things that are set apart. So there are a lot of traditions just part of that. Um, what God has has set apart, what's holy, what's sacred, and and namely a point that um, Janice Smith, Doctor Janice Smith, brought out is that well, if we don't recognize the individual, the human being, as sacred, then everything is messed up. Like we're sacred, we're yeah. holy. God created us good, and so men, us men, we do have to tap into that and realize that and operate. In our space, as you said. Okay. Well, so what about, uh, you know, the church is trying to deal with the fact that 67% of Catholics do not believe in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. They've put on a big shindig the next year, this time, uh, $28 million to host a big get together in Indianapolis. And yet there is, doesn't seem to be a real effort by the leadership to return us to the sense of the sacred, what's good, what's true, what's holy, when it comes to dealing with the issue of why Catholics don't believe in the Holy Eucharist. We can't talk about communion on the tongue, on knees, uh, at an altar rail, because that seems too traditional for most folks. And yet, it's not about tradition. It's about what's sacred, treating the uh, Eucharistic species as sacred, as holy, as God himself seems to be like, well, we can't really talk about that. Do you take it that way or no? Yeah, I agree. I've had that same criticism or at least that same concern that that perhaps the um, this call to the Holy Eucharist, this Holy Eucharist, this revival of the Holy Eucharist, perhaps it should have been, it should have been prefaced by a revival or um, a call to confession in sacraments of penance and reconciliation, because I think that is really the one thing that prepares us best. We have to recognize we're sinners. <laughs> we have to recognize like our, our condition and who can heal that condition first. And then I think we can, we're in a better position to adore him and to love him who, who created us for that. So I um, you always, have, yeah, I, I definitely, I'm with you and that, that, that concern of how do we return to the sacred? How do we return to really believing in a real presence if we're just disordered in ourselves and that we're not dealing with the condition of sin in the world and in our lives, because there's, there's a gulf between us and God that we have to deal with before we can truly see him with, with clear eyes. It seems to me after listening to your 27 guests in this course, again, we're going to be linking to it in the show notes that there is a, let's, let's just be Catholic. Let the chips fall where they may follow truth to whatever conclusion to the conclusion that it brings to you. In other words, 
and this is the criticism I have on the, on the Eucharistic Congress, is that it's tying our hands on what we're allowed to deal with and discuss in order to bring about a return to the sacred. Whereas your guests in your course seem to say, listen, follow truth. It's a person, Jesus Christ. And where that concludes is where we want to be. And I think that is a big takeaway in the return to the sacred and dispelling the darkness in the world. Wouldn't you agree? The courage to follow Absolutely. truth. Absolutely. That's... Yeah, that's the Dominican principle. Um, you know, I like myself to um, really be in love and be a participant, be a be a follower of Dominican spirituality. And the pursuit of veritas, the pursuit of truth, is is a first principle. And like you said, truth is a person. So that's that's where we begin, and that's where we end. So, all right, the website, saintdominicmedia.com, where this course is 27 lectures on a return to the sacred. Uh, I don't, you don't require registration. You just click the play button, right? Yeah, and I fiddled around with that because, of course, as a business, there's some advantages of making people register because you get, you get them on an email list and all this stuff. But, um, but how, how do we make this most accessible? If this is the most important subject, the thing that we have to deal with, you know, it's not really about St. Dominic's Media. All 27 people, we got them because nobody charged me money. Nobody said, hey, you got to pay me to do this. So um, we're going to make this as free as we can and accessible as we can. And so that's just come, click, play, as Joe said. Yeah, yeah. The irrational fear of the sacred. That was my aversion. That was my participation in this uh, course. And uh, we're going to make sure you get a link to that one in particular. Because I'm not, is it the best one? I don't want to say so. But anyway, we'll leave it to you. SaintDominicMedia.com is the website. We'll link to it in the show notes. God bless you, David O'Grey. We'll see you next time.